how this ever happened to you? You're on YouTube searching for ways to improve your study method and you come across someone that recommends this new technique that seems to be just what you need. All excited, you watch the video, learn the technique and think that at last, here's the method that'll make me learn and ace all of my exams. But then you actually start using the method and slowly but surely you realize that the results are just not what you expected and that maybe you're even worse now than you were before. Has it happened? Well, don't worry, you're not alone. In fact, one of the things that not discussed when sharing these study techniques is that they don't provide the same results to everyone. Indeed, some studies like this one from Dr. Eskenazi prove that sometimes there are interventions that improve performance to some while decreasing it to others. These techniques sometimes produce such positive effects in the group that is benefited that despite lowering the performance of others, the average result across the sample increases. This of course makes the study report the intervention as an overall positive one and thus, voila, it starts being recommended in the videos such as the one you just saw. And so when you see a video recommending a technique, you might see the overall results and think, hey, this is great, without realizing you could be part of the group that's actually hurt by the intervention. That's not so great. And so how can you know if a technique will work for you? And more importantly, how can you fix a method that has potential but it's just not working for you at the moment. Well, fortunately enough, most of the time there's one underlying principle explaining the results in these types of studies. It is called the 85% rule for optimal learning, and by understanding it, you will be able to not only predict if a study technique will work for you, but also understand how you might change it and modify it so it produces a better result no matter in which group you happen to be located. However, to properly understand this rule, we first have to take a step back and review the biological process that mediates all forms of learning. You must understand the basic things about synaptic plasticity. Synaptic plasticity in simple terms is the reconnection of neurons to form new activation patterns. You see, every time you learn something new, your brain is actively connecting and disconnecting neurons to see which combination works better to produce the outcome you desire. However, the thing you have to keep in mind, you have to understand, is that neurons don't connect and reconnect just because. One would think that doing something like grabbing a book and starting to read would trigger this sort of process, but turns out it only does to a very small degree. Um, we really shouldn't be surprised by this. You see, the problem is that for thousands of years your brain has had only two goals in mind. Survive and reproduce. That's it. So he just doesn't see a reason to spend all of this valuable energy connecting and reconnecting neurons if the end goal is just not that important. And again, just putting him to read doesn't make him understand the importance any better. Something similar happens with your muscles. Although everyone would like to have big and strong muscles and one could argue about the potential evolutionary benefits of having them, your body is simply not interested in spending all the energy it takes to actually build them, especially if the way they are right now is enough to do the job. So it is not until you make your muscles realize that the environment requires them to be bigger that they actually start to grow. That's why you can spend your entire life caring for them, asking them, praying to them, but the only way they actually grow is by forcing them through pressure. In the gym, you do this by lifting progressively heavier and heavier weights. And in learning, you do it by lifting progressively heavier and heavier books. Alright, no, but you get the point. Your mind, as well as your muscles, grows and learns optimally when pressured. No, not that type of pressure. I'm talking about the type of pressure that forces your mind to work harder, to think, to be engaged. This type of pressure is precisely what makes most of the study techniques work. If you think about it, you'll realize that most, if not all, of these study techniques that you come across do the exact same thing they make learning more difficult. This is the case of active learning, of the testing effect, the generation effect, the coordinate note-taking system of elaborative encoding, active learning, like you name it. Each one of these techniques makes learning more difficult in its own way. It might be by, for example, forcing your mind to actively think when you could just be reading along or to generate a question when you could just transcribe what you're reading. Whatever the case, you end up making the whole learning process harder and it is precisely this increased level of difficulty that tells your mind she has to work harder and this extra mental effort is what truly mediates the increased learning. This is precisely the reason why world renowned cognitive psychologist Dr. Robert Bork describes effective learning techniques as desirable difficulties because after all they are strategies that make learning harder but also more effective, and that's why they are desirable. And as I just said, there are tons of these, from the ones that you've probably listened over and over again to some that you most likely have never heard before. For instance, there is something called the disfluency effect. 
Have you heard of it? The disfluency effect basically states that when trying to learn something new, the use of a typographic text that is harder to read, such as sans forgetica, makes the person learn and remember the information better as compared to if it was read using an easy to read typography such as Open Sans. And as crazy as this sounds, this is actually one of the findings that has been replicated across the board throughout a bunch of experiments. What we think happens is that when you make the text harder to read, your brain is forced to pay more attention to it, to spend a little more time with the material and make an effort to understand what is written. And this extra mental effort is what causes the extra learning. Perfect, then to optimize my learning, all I have to do is to start listening to all of my lectures in Old Greek and take notes in Chinese, and then I'm gonna review them from right to left and bottom up. Mm, no. You see, although difficulties do seem to be the key, not every level of difficulty is desirable. This was demonstrated by the study of Dr. Eskenazi that we briefly showed at the beginning of the video. He basically tried to see if there was a different rate of learning using the disfluency effect in students with high versus low linguistic abilities. And as you can clearly see by the graph, the use of this fluent typography produced totally different outcomes among the groups. The ones with high linguistic ability, which are this one right here, benefited with a close to 30% increase in learning, whereas the low linguistic ability group experienced a 20% drop in performance. At first glance, this might seem like just bad luck, but it's really not. Let me explain through a metaphor. Imagine that in a given fitness class, everyone is lifting 10 pounds in the bicep curls. There are gonna be people who naturally lift these 10 pounds with ease, and there are gonna be the ones who really struggle with the weight. The first ones would benefit greatly if the weight is increased, as this would raise the difficulty to a more appropriate level. More difficulty, more effort, more effort, more gains. But on the other hand, the ones who were already struggling with the 10 pounds are going to be beat down by the increasing weight, to the point that some of them might just stop being able to lift the weight at all, and even risk injury. By this point, the increased difficulty is not beneficial, is detrimental. Something similar happens in learning and might be happening to you right now. You're trying to apply a lot of these techniques that, yes, in theory work, just as weightlifting works in theory, but you're applying them in a way that elevates the levels of difficulty maybe too much, maybe to the point that you're no longer seeing results, just injuries. Now, this obviously doesn't mean that the solution is then to strip all the weight from the machine and never go back to the gym. No, the solution is to adjust the weight, to find the appropriate level of challenge. This appropriate level actually has a name, a technical name. It is called the Zone of Proximal Development, and it was first coined in 1930 by Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky. The Zone of Proximal Development basically states that learning is maximized when the trainee faces a challenge that is just outside of his comfort zone. Not too easy, not too hard. Now, during the last few years, we've tried to run several experiments and simulations to know exactly where is this Zone of Proximal Development. And according to the latest estimates provided in this Nature paper, the Zone of Proximal Development appears to be located in a rate of easiness to difficulty of around 85%, which means that to optimize learning, the difficulty has to be arranged so that 15% of your trials end up in failure or are difficult and 85% are easy or end up successful. To give you an example, imagine you want to learn how to throw a paper into a beam from a couple of meters away. So instead of starting the practice from the couple of meters away, where your success rate maybe just be, I don't know, 10%, you would take the beam as close as needed so that approximately 8 out of every 10 attempts go in and 2 go out. Once you master this distance, you get a little bit further until the difficulty goes back again to 85%, and you repeat this process over and over again until you reach the desired distance. In theory, by practicing like this, you should see results 30% faster than if you were to start practicing by the two meters right away. A more academic example of this is imagine you're studying for an exam using practice questions. Instead of starting out with a session that leaves you with just a 50% of answers correct, you would dial down the difficulty so that your initial rate of success is around 85%. As you learn more and become better, you dial up the difficulty accordingly, always trying to stay in that zone of proximal development. Now, the other benefit of understanding the 85% rule is that you can also predict if a learning technique will work for you. You only have to think about your current level of difficulty and consider if adding a greater challenge will put you closer to the zone of proximal development or get you far away and over the board. For instance, if you're learning a second language and you find most practice exercises really simple, adding desirable difficulties, like for example, removing the subtitles from videos and movies might be just exactly what you need. But if on the other hand, you're just barely learning the basics and you're really struggling to get a grasp on the most basic stuff, adding desirable difficulties will probably be detrimental to your learning. Hey Joe, you know it's Hey Joe? Ah, it's hello? 
Hello! ¿Y qué es hello? So overall, the two points you have to take out of this video is that one, we learn better through challenges or desirable difficulties. And two, that the right challenge is a moving target. It depends on where you are in your learning process. So start finding ways to challenge yourself to learn by solving problems. If you don't know where to begin or how this might look like, take a look at Brilliant. Brilliant, for those who don't know, is a learning platform that teaches STEM-related topics through interactive challenges. For the past few weeks, I've been testing out their platform, trying out their classes on scientific thinking and logic, and I have just fallen in love with how they manage to sort of gamify the learning process and put you right into the zone of proximal development. It truly feels like you're playing a video game, just that in every level, you're learning something new. And so if you're another learning aficionado like me and want to learn more about logic, probability, computer science, and even astrophysics, you have to check out Brilliant. You can get a free trial of the platform by using the link in the description. And if you like what you see and would like to make a purchase, you can also use my link to get a 20% off discount. But anyways, in case you want to learn more about the science of effective learning, I leave you here another video you might find interesting. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you guys in the next one.